Okay. Well, that's a huge crowd for this. <laughs> um, uh, so I want to remind the three of you, but whoever's watching this video also that on Thursday, this class will be by Zoom only. Okay. And right with that, move to George Grant. Um, right, so we've suddenly skipped, uh, like. We've left all those people who are like wrote around 1900 or whatever. Um, and we've skipped to a later generation that wasn't born until 1918. Um, and uh, I, and um, yeah, what can I say about him? He so he was from a distinguished. Canadian intellectual and political family. Um, so, like, despite his kind of constant deprecation of the Canadian establishment, <laughs> he actually wasn't really an outsider. Um, um, Michael Ignatieff, you might have heard of, I don't know, he's kind of a famous public intellectual, but he was also was the um, leader of the Liberal Party in Canada from 2008 to 2011. A very unsuccessful leader. <laughs> but Michael Ignatieff was his nephew. So, um, and, uh, and Lester Pearson uh, is for some reason known as Mike Pearson. I don't know the reason for that is. But anyway, uh, Pearson, who the like liberal politician that he shows so much scorn to in this book was like someone who at one point was a good friend of his actually, so like someone he knew. Um, um, so like in that way, he's unlike John Diefenbaker. Um, it's kind of like the, his hero, at least for the purpose of this book, his hero, right? Uh, years up here also, 1895, uh, 1979. You know, who uh, is a uh, conservative prime minister of Canada. He was prime minister from 1957 to 1963. Um, and he was he was from a rural background. He grew up in Saskatchewan, so he, he actually was kind of an outlier. <laughs> um, um, okay, so that's one thing about him. I mean, I'm not sure if that's important or not. I actually, so I actually found, and you can probably find this too. How did I find it? It's one of the footnotes in Wikipedia. But, that Michael Ignatieff wrote uh, like a op-ed about him, I guess, which was titled, well, I mean, when you write something for a newspaper, you don't really choose the title, right? like they choose the title. But anyway, the title was, George Grant was wrong, wrong, wrong. <laughs> and, and in it, like part of his, part of it is he's saying that like the subtext of this book is like family, <laughs> like uh, conflicts or whatever. But anyway, I, I, I'm sure that's not an important part of the explanation for why I wrote that. <laughs> In any case, uh, okay. So, um, so George Grant was uh, conservative um, as opposed to liberal, right? I mean. Those are, I mean, among other things, the names of two political parties in Canada, right? Conservative and liberal, but um, um, but also like he's using them to mean something. 
Um, and it's using it to mean something, I think, uh, somewhat unfamiliar to us, uh, especially to Americans, as for reasons that Grant emphasizes. Um, I mean, it's closer to the meaning those terms have at least traditionally had in Britain. Um, so, like, liberalism, on the one hand, is about and I guess it's also closer to the literal meaning of the terms than the way we use them now in America, right? So like liberalism is about freedom, right? That's what liberalism means, right? Freedom, freedomism. Um, but, and it's especially about free enterprise and free trade, right? So, I mean, I guess like it's related to, or perhaps the same as what people now call, uh, sometimes call neoliberalism. Right, like you all know, neoliberalism isn't liberalism. <laughs> that is, it isn't what we in America call liberalism. Um, so, uh, um, but also, so like, especially about free enterprise and free trade, but also, at least according to Grant, it's about quote emancipation, emancipation of the passions. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, Grant traces, maybe I should write this thing up here, liberalism. So it's about freedom. Grant traces that to um, basically Locke, so, and implicitly, am I going off the end of the board? Although he never mentions this. We, um, and he says that liberalism is the natural ally of what he calls corporation capitalism. Um, whereas on the other hand, conservatism I mean, this is in a sense easy to understand. It's about conserving the past. Tradition. Um, and therefore, according to Grant, um, and both that is, according to Grant's analysis of what this means, uh, according to, but also according to Grant's analysis of the tradition of Canadian conservatism. Um, conservatism is not opposed to socialism. On the contrary, socialism is like a naturally conservative system because it means uh, like um, taking control of the economy for national ends <laughs> um, for the for the for the public good. Um, as opposed to just letting it be free. That would be that's liberalism. Um, now, I mean, of course, conservatism doesn't favor Marxism, but the truth is that uh, Grant has an analysis of Marxism according to which Marxism also is essentially conservative. It is at least is certainly according to him more conservative than corporation capitalism. So I'll talk about that when I get to it. I think I hope. Um, um, and I think this also goes together with something about Grant's earlier politics. So this was, I mean, he had, I guess, long since given up on this by 1965, but early on he was what's called a one empire loyalist, right? Like he, you know, so he wasn't so much a Canadian nationalist as like someone who thought that the the British Empire should stay together, like be one 
state kind of. Um, so, uh, and that's also like an expression of his conservatism, right? Like keep what we have, don't let it get lost. When he talks about the end of the British empire or the end of British power, he never seems to um, think there might be any respect in which someone would say, well, good riddance. <laughs> like it's, it's only about something good that's been lost. Um, now, I mean, so, right, so, so this is what Grant means by calling himself conservative, and it's what he expects from the Conservative Party of Canada. Um, it's, you know, since then, although, I mean, I think it was already starting to happen then, and that's part one thing that Grant complains about, but since then, there's been, I think, a shift in the meaning of these terms and in, like, positions of these parties toward the more American version, <laughs> as, as Grant would predict. <laughs> um, uh, so... Um, <sighs> Uh, um, even in Canada, maybe this seems strange now. I think actually the truth is, even at the time Grant published this book, people thought it was strange to, to claim to be both conservative and socialist, anti-corporations, uh, pacifist, so he, he was, um, as you can see in this book, he kind of reluctantly and late modified his pacifism to say that, well, yeah, I guess World War II was necessary, <laughs> right? And, and he also sometimes says, yes, maybe NATO is necessary to defend against, you know, the communist empire or whatever, um, but it's reluctant. Um, for the most part, he was a pacifist and the, the issue that like sparks the book is the uh, you know um, question of whether a Canada is going to accept nuclear warheads and its missiles, right? So, so socialist, anti-corporations, pacifist. Um, also, although this doesn't really show up in the book, uh, environmentalist, um, anti-technology, anti. GMOs, right? The term didn't exist yet then, but you can see sometimes he makes references to the new biochemistry and how like bad it is, basically. Um, so like I think even in 1965, in, even in Canada, people had trouble like thinking of that as conservative. And I think like um the people who were most influenced by Grant and who like carried on his thought were mostly on the left, not on the right. Um, um, but I mean, in order to do that, they had to uh, they had to overlook certain aspects of his thought where it really is conservative. So um, um so I think, I mean, maybe kind of related to that, although it's weird and hard to, well, I mean, everything about this is weird and hard to understand. So an important influence on Grant is, if I write this down here, we'll be able to see it. Among several important influences, but pretty visible in this book, is Leo Strauss. So Leo Strauss was a German uh, philosopher, intellectual, um, Jewish. So uh, he left Germany and came to this country. He was at the University of Chicago for many years. Um, um, It's hard for me to summarize. Well, I think it would be hard for anyone to summarize his views, partly because 
like something that at least is central to the way he writes. He, so he mostly wrote about the history of philosophy. Um, he was interested in medieval Arabic philosophy. He started off writing about Spinoza, actually. Then he was interested in Maimonides. Then he uh, was very interested in Machiavelli and also ancient philosophy, Plato especially. Um, so he wrote uh, all kinds of stuff about the history of philosophy. And like the principle of um, his readings is always that the authors don't necessarily say what they actually think. And that you have to read really carefully, you know, to figure out what the message actually is. So of course, if someone says that, then <laughs> you, you at least, whether you're going to read all the other texts that way, you, you definitely have to read their text that way. Right? <laughs> so, you know, um, so it's like, even I, like to report things he thought, and I am going to say some of them when they, things come up in Grant, but it's always going to be with like uncertainty as to whether Strauss believes this, wants certain parts of his audience to believe it, maybe not all parts of his audience, whatever. Um, there's a famous uh, line in one of his early essays, um, persecution and the, what's it called? Persecution, the art of writing maybe? Am I getting two different titles mixed up? Anyway, so like he says that, um, Philosophers, on the one hand, have a desire not to be killed, and on the other hand, have a desire to uh, like um, communicate with the young of their race. And so they have to hide what they're actually saying. But you know, um, there again, it's not clear. He's not afraid he's going to be killed. <laughs> Why, you know. Uh, that applies maybe sometimes to some specific, like Socrates, obviously, right? And that, that's, you know, so on a Straussian reading of Socrates, a lot of it is about why Socrates was killed, what warning there is for us in that, or something like that. But anyway, but like it's hard to get to the bottom of what it really means by that. Um, one thing I can say about it, but this is also weird. So his writings don't have. Uh, much, if any, like contemporary political content, right? Like unlike this book, which is all about, you know, or has huge parts that are all about the details of Canadian politics and whatever, Strauss is most like, it's all about the history of philosophy. Um, and he wasn't particularly politically active himself, but it seems like almost all his students are really right wing. <laughs> So um, um, Alan Bloom, the author of Closing of the American Mind, you may have heard of him. He was, he was one of Strauss's students. Um, uh, one who I met at Harvard was Harvey Mansfield. Um, <laughs> Harvey C. Mansfield, who was known affectionately as Harvey C. Minus Mansfield, because among other things, he was against great inflation. <laughs> but. Uh, um, yeah, so, and, you know, I met him and I talked to him when I was in grad school. I never like, enrolled in the course with him. I mean, I've been crazy, but, <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, and he was really interested to talk to and whatever, but I also knew that he, um, had gone to Colorado. So when they had, I guess, what was the issue here? They, they passed a constitutional amendment saying that municipalities couldn't extend equal rights to gays or something like that. And he went and like testified and, then, and it, was, it was eventually ruled unconstitutional that is inconsistent with the federal constitution. But so he actually went to the uh, trial and testified that homosexuality undermines civilization. <laughs> Which is weird, especially when you think of how much time he spent reading the Greeks, <laughs> right? So anyway, like now, so like 
George Grant uh, is not very much like those people, I feel like, although he is or thinks of himself as politically on the right. Um, and there is one comment of this, like sarcastic comment in this reading about whether we prefer women or dogs or boys, no one much cares. <laughs> but, um, um, and he was very much opposed to abortion also, which, you know, I mean, you could see how that would fit in, right? I mean, it doesn't fit in an American political life, but you can see how the same person who would be against like genetic modification and like uh, social engineering to change human nature would also be against abortion, right? Which again is like, like taking control of the human body. That's right. That's exactly why most of us think that abortion I, I actually, I don't know about people in this room, <laughs> but many of us feel that abortion rights should be protected because the woman's control of her own body should be protected. Like that, um, uh, that's an example of the attitude towards nature that Grant thinks is, dis is destructive. <laughs> Any, or anyway, it could be seen that way, right? So, um, like, again, his left-wing followers in Canada are just well, embarrassed about that thing. <laughs> so, but, right, so, so he, you know, so I guess what I'm saying is he is maybe, he was maybe in some ways, like, what we would call socially conservative, um, but I don't know. I don't get the feeling of... With Strauss himself, and even more so with his students, you get the feeling that they're kind of, I don't know, happily doing something sinister. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, they, you don't get that feeling from Brandt at all, but he, he took a lot from Strauss. I mean, I have to say, I learned things from Strauss too. Like I think to a large, I, not necessarily true for all the people that he talks about and the conclusions I reach wouldn't be exactly the same. But I, you know, like I think he's right about Plato that, um, that it, you know, that the main point isn't really about the theory of form, that, you know, if there's if something is F and there exists a form F and whatever stuff like that, that it's about why was Socrates killed and what does that mean about the nature of virtue and you know so in any case um so like I said that's kind of weird and hard to account for and and it it just makes it murkier like what the relationship between like this difference in Grant's mind is and what we might call a difference between conservative and liberal or left and right wing um Okay. Um, another important influence was Heidegger. Um, I guess assuming you know who Heidegger is, I don't know why I should assume that, but anyway. Uh, another important influence is Heidegger. I think that shows up more in Grant's later writings, um, but um, um, you can see it here, or see, I don't know whether this is influence of Heidegger or whether this is what made him appreciate Heidegger, but the feeling that America and Russia are kind of two sides of the same problem. And the problem has to do with technology. So that's, you know, that's what later Heidegger is all about. Um, uh, you know, it was one reason why, I mean, so like Grant was not attracted, of course, to the idea that um, that problem could be sol solved by Nazi Germany, the way Heidegger was at some point, <laughs> right? That that was the great like bastion against this problem. Uh, I think, you know, Heidegger himself after the war decided that, that this is the thing, people wonder why Heidegger never apologized for like supporting the Nazis. And I think, you know, I think he did apologize in his own way. It's just not uh, an apology that we like because what he said was, 
that um, yes, he was wrong to think that Nazism was any better than America or Russia, <laughs> right? That they're all terrible. <laughs> um, so, uh, whereas like we want him to say is, okay, I admit the allies were the good guys, you know, and he, he wouldn't say that. So, I mean, Grant, um, so like, so first of all, presumably Strauss wasn't attracted to that, right? He was telling him that to leave Germany, so or the Nazis would have killed him. Um, but yet Grant, um, you know, uh, I think, concedes that no, having the Nazis take over the world would have been worse. <laughs> um, but uh, but between America and Russia, he doesn't see much to, to choose. Um, so, and, if, and, and again, if anything, to the extent that Russia is Marxist, he sees it as less of a threat because he sees Marxism as less progressive <laughs> than corporation capitalism. Um, so that's something that either he agrees with Heidegger about or he took from Heidegger. Um, the analysis of technology and what's bad of technology, I think in his later writings, you can see more explicit influence of Heidegger on that. Like It seems like most of what he says about technology in this book you know, could just as well come straight from Dune. It's just with the opposite valuation, but it's the same story. Uh, okay. Um, so I'm gonna erase all of this, except maybe for John Peter Baker. I mean, I will have to mention some of this stuff again. Um, Okay, so this book, Lament for a Nation, I think I said, was published in 1955. Um, now, on the cover of our edition, which is the one that's in print, it's like the 50th anniversary edition or something. So, there's this big, like, ripped up Canadian maple flag, which is a big mistake <laughs> because, um, because Stephen Baker, so in the 1964 election, right? So Stephen Baker uh, lost a vote of confidence in parliament in 1963. So there had to be new elections. There were new elections in 1964, and in 1964, uh, Deepen Baker was defeated by Pearson, the liberal candidate. So, um, and in that election, among other issues, one issue was the flag. <laughs> and Pearson was the one who was pushing the new maple leaf flag, whereas Deepen Baker was in favor of the old flag, which is called the red ensign. And <laughs> This picture of the red ensign. Although actually, I think when it was used as a flag of Canada, it usually had the Canadian coat of arms um, uh, in the red part. I'm going to share it on Zoom too. People can see it better. That's right. That's the red ensign. And this um, this is a. I mean, I got this on Wikipedia. Uh, I guess I could stop sharing. Them. I got this on Wikipedia. This is a poster from uh, the Canadian elections of 1891. And this is John McDonald, who Grant sometimes mentions. He was one of the main architects of Confederation and he was the first prime minister of Canada. And one of, he served on and off for a long time. Um, uh, so here he's shown holding the red ensign and it says the old flag, the old policy, the old leader. <laughs> um, right, Grant discusses his, what's known as the national policy. The national policy was his protectionist policy of keeping the Canadian economy separate from the US economy and tied to Britain. Um, 
Right. So it shouldn't be a maple leaf flag on the ripped up on the cover. It should be the red enzyme. Um, anyway, right. So the issue that sparked the book, I mean, if you if you did the reading, you you know hopefully a lot more about this than I'm gonna say, but um that you know the issue was Canada accepting uh nuclear warheads from the US, right? So you can yeah, I mean you can read Grant's account of that. Um, in chapter three, there's more about it in chapter one and two, which I didn't assign. Um, you could also read, you know, I linked on a syllabus to the Wikipedia account of this, um, which is somewhat different from Grant's account. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, I'm not going to say a lot of, about the details of this. Um, it was, I mean, it was felt at least by Grant. And by Diefenbaker, that the Kennedy administration uh, decided that Diefenbaker had to go and, you know, like manipulated things to make sure he would be out of power. Um, um, I think, like, I think the details, I mean, okay, so the details of historical events here I know are important to Grant because, like, half the book is about them. I think they're important to understanding what he's saying. Um, uh, maybe even essential, but I'm not going to discuss the details of them very much because I want the time and I want to talk about the things that connect to the other people who read in this course. Um, but, um, but you do have to understand, I mean, in it, like in addition to the things about Grant's own political position that I said to begin with, so like what moral Grant took from those events. And the moral was that Canada is already gone, right? That's why it's called lament for a nation. So, you know, he says like, yeah, of course, formal, like actual annexation may take a long time, but that's just a formality. It's been established that Canada is not really independent. It's just a satellite of the United States. Um, and at least officially, the purpose of the book is to explain why that happened, why it was inevitable, and pause to lament it, <laughs> right? So that is, it's not to suggest some way to make things better. Um, I think it's very hard for us to read it that way. For us Americans and Canadians <laughs> um, after Grant, it's hard to read it that way. Um, I think Grant would say about that, well, of course it's hard for you to read it that way because you believe in progress. Right, so um, you believe that like whatever happens, it's just uh, you should treat it as um, the means to bring about something better in the end. You have to fight for, you know, there must be some way. <laughs> right? and, um, and Grant says, no, like I believe in fate. In, in tragic fate. <laughs> so the, the, it's inevitable, it's bad, and there's nothing to do about it except like, you know, as individuals, we can um, use it to orient our soul in a certain way or something like that, right? But, he, but, but, uh, but there's no political platform. Um, you know, whether Grant himself even acted consistently with that, I think is not clear. Like he would go and speak and, you know, uh, he didn't just, after he wrote this book, set, spend all his time sitting around lamenting. He wrote a bunch more books. And um, uh, although he never wrote the really kind of long systematic book that might be expected. 
the things he wrote later are are short in some ways fragmentary. Yeah. Um, but um, but it, again, at least officially, like that's the way you should read it. I think um, in some ways uh, we may have a similar problem in talking about Coates starting next week. That his book also his book starts with someone asking him, "Well, but isn't there hope for the future?" And he says, "At that moment when they asked me that, I realized that, that I hadn't succeeded in, in communicating." <laughs> Um, so, and I noticed like on the back, uh, I think it's on the, I think it's on the back of the edition that I have, uh, between the world and me, it says like how in this, in this best-selling book, Coates does X, Y, and Z and offers a transcendent hope for the future. And I, I think like that's something that the blurb writer put in because it's got to be there, right? <laughs> I mean, you can't you can't write a book about problems in America without offering a transcendent hope for the future. But he like he does. <laughs> I mean, well, okay, I'll talk more about posts when we get to codes. But uh, so uh, right. So again, like the people. And again, mostly people on the left who inherited Grant's thought or responded, you know, were influenced in by some way, mostly said, but of course, we don't want this pessimism. <laughs> um, uh, now, um, and as a result, uh, the publication of the book, despite what its at least official purposes, did like like serve to promote Canadian nationalism, <laughs> at least in some circles, right? And it became kind of like a foundational text of of uh, like Canadian studies or whatever, like at least intellectual Canadian nationalism. Um, Which again, like uh, Grant, I guess would have predicted was impossible. Although I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe he would classify it under like isolated intellectuals in universities, and therefore it has no effect. I'm not sure. Um, but the truth is, like in general, Grant's ability as a as a forecaster. Um, is mixed at best, right? Like, I mean, if, you, if you look and see what he says is going to happen in future American and Canadian elections and so on and so forth, it's not very accurate. <laughs> um, uh, so, uh, um, I mean, I don't think he's less accurate than Dewey or Adams or Du Bois, you know, at forecasting what's going to happen. Uh, but um, you might kind of expect him to be more accurate because he keeps saying how, well, anyways, maybe he doesn't keep saying this, but he says or implies at least once that he's the only one who has a realistic view of the 20th century and who knows what's really happened. But it turns out that, like, you know, I think, I mean, maybe this is just in the short run, and in the long run, he's right. But if so, that, like, the short run has been pretty long. Since 1965, so far, he doesn't seem to be exactly right. Um, um, so, you know, like, therefore, so what? Um, well, so so something, right? I mean, if he were right about all his forecasts, then then you should like leave this book. <laughs> if not, you you know, I mean, you have to ask, uh, like, okay, what did he miss something? What did he miss? Um, but I mean, uh, I mean, there's like there's never a philosophy book worth teaching that's right about it. So like on a, on a 
on a more general level, that's why I say so what. Yeah, okay, it's not right. It's still interesting. <laughs> um, okay, so as I said, the like the point of the book is to explain why Canada is lost. Um, so what is the explanation? So first of all, he agrees with Dewey um, that the fundamental force here is the progress of science. Um, and the progress of science uh, in turn drives the progress of technique and technology. Um, I mean, I guess he agrees with Dewey that if science is done right, maybe I shouldn't say it drives the, that like its purpose is technique or technology. Right, remember Dewey said that like um, people who think they're just gonna do pure science and they don't care about how it's applied, like aren't doing it right, basically. <laughs> um, so uh, um, I think he agrees with Dewey about that too. Right, so he thinks that modern science fundamentally is aimed at the uh, extension of technology or in general of technique. I mean, he just uses the term technology. Um, Strauss and Heidegger both have things they say about that word, about like why techne and logos get put together in that way and why in the ancient world they weren't put together in that way. And, various things like that. Um, Grant is probably thinking about some of that, but I don't see a lot of signs of it in this book. Maybe the later stuff, but not this book. So technology, let's say, I think he's like using it to cover both what I gather Dewey means by technique and what he means by technology. Although I'm not absolutely sure what Dewey means by technique. <laughs> but so it's like all the, methods for the control of nature, human and non-human. Um, that, right, so again, I think he agrees with, um, with Dewey and I guess like with Bacon about like what the purpose of modern science is. It's to control nature, it's technology and technique. Um, and he agrees with Dewey that that in turn necessarily produces a non-static, a dynamic society. Right, so this is chapter five on page 65. Um, he's talking about why uh, true conservatism has become impossible. The practical men who call themselves conservatives must commit themselves to a science that leads to the conquest of nature. This is the practical men who call themselves conservatives must commit themselves to a science that leads that leads to the conquest of nature. By practical, in 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 this context, he means like if they want to be elected. <laughs> they have to commit to a science that leads to the conquest of nature. This science produces such a dynamic society that it is impossible to conserve anything for long. Right, so you can't be a true conservative and, and be practical about it because to be practical, you have to commit yourself to science and science produces a dynamic society and dynamic society makes it impossible to conserve things. And again, as in Dewey, this is tied to, uh, especially to a kind of, well, what for Dewey is optimism, but for Grant, and here I think probably to most of us, most of us would feel more like Grant. To Grant sounds like pessimism uh, about the, the advance in social science and the ability to engineer society, right? So this is the bottom of page 62. The new methods the social sciences use to dissolve the opposition in friendly or enemy societies are welcomed by the government of the United States. And then he 
he cites some uh, paper toward a technology of human behavior for defense use. <laughs> American psychologist, August 1962. Well, uh, you know, so like, okay, it turned out that maybe the social sciences didn't have a really great set of techniques for absolving, dissolving all opposition in uh, friendly or enemy societies. <laughs> like, uh, you know, Maybe if, like, the, if there really were such, such techniques, the Vietnam War would have gone a lot differently, <laughs> um, or the war in Afghanistan, or whatever, right? So, but like Dewey, he you know he thinks that such techniques already exist, and you know, or, or at least are just around the corner. Um, so that's part of so science means not just physical science, but social science. And what's going to result is a technology, not just for um, like harnessing electricity to make more widgets, but like for uh, controlling the psychology and culture, etc. Um, so so far, as I'm saying, he agrees with Dewey. Um, he may not understand the origin of this situation the same way Dewey does, however. So, um, and, and that may be related to their different assessments of it, not directly related, but well, let me see what the difference is. So like Dewey talks about impersonal science. So, I mean, first of all, I'm not sure, like Dewey doesn't directly address the issue that I'm raising here. I'm just kind of gathering from his tone or whatever. He, he seems to suggest that the advance of science is, so to speak, natural, right? Like it's a result of natural necessity right? that science advances. You can't stop it. Um, whether that's completely consistent with his picture of science as a society, I'm not sure. But I mean, maybe it is, again, because Dewey emphasizes the uniqueness and individuality and initiative of scientists, but doesn't really emphasize their autonomy, right? Doesn't em emphasize their individuality in that sense. In, in any case, be that as it may, uh, like, you know, so if you were to ask Dewey, so how come they didn't have, um, uh, continuous advance in technology and the resulting dynamic society in ancient times. Why did it have to wait till modern times? I think Dewey would say, well, science just hadn't advanced enough yet. Right? Um, so, like, there was science then, there was ancient science, but it wasn't very advanced. <laughs> So it hadn't got to the point of setting off this dynamic society yet. Whereas Grant, I think, I mean, all, Grant also is not very explicit about this, but I think Grant is following Strauss. Um, Strauss also maybe is not as explicit as it could be about this. And, and, and remember, I, I even said, even if he is explicit, you're not sure if that's what he means, but Strauss seems to say, that the ancients didn't have a science whose goal was to conquer nature because they were wise enough not to have a science. <laughs> um, uh, they understood that it was a possibility and they rejected it because they saw that it was a bad thing. Um, and they hear, so, and I, I think Strauss says that meaning possibly Strauss believes that. <laughs> um, and I think Grant is following Strauss in thinking about um, uh, science and technology that way. So, 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 so like modern science is something that didn't exist in ancient times. Um, a lot of people would agree with that. Um, I mean, I think I would agree with that. But um, the reason it didn't, so it wasn't just less advanced. There was no such thing. The reason it didn't exist, this part I wouldn't agree with, is not because no one had thought of it, 
but because they have thought of it and just and realized that they shouldn't do it. <laughs> um, so, and they, like the ancients who were supposed to have realized this means especially Plato. Um, now, I mean, um, not that, I mean, I think Strauss is one of those people who doesn't play up the difference between Plato and Aristotle, it plays it down, right? But there's a lot of continuity between Plato and Aristotle. Well, obviously they disagree about something, <laughs> um, but uh, but it's still more Plato that Strauss would go to. And um, uh, Grant also, I think, regards himself as a kind of Platonist, um, but, uh, as I was saying before, so like, first of all, so this is very different from the metaphysical Plato. It's very different both from kind of like the 20th century analytic metaphysical Plato. That's the one I was referring to before where like, if you write about Plato, so the question, the questions are like, Okay, so if there is an X that is F, does that mean there's a form that is F and then there's a P and then there's a, you know, blah, blah, blah. And uh, uh, so it's uh, not that Plato. It's also not the Neoplatonist Plato that Emerson is um, connected to, right? Like the Plotinus's Plato. It's this political Plato. <laughs> um, um, Plato was fundamentally concerned about the relationship between philosophy and the city, philosophy and the polis. Um, and, uh, and, you know, as part of that is, or maybe the fundamental part of that is, again, like understanding what philosophy should say and what it should not say, what it should keep silent, about, what it should do and what it shouldn't do. Um, um, right, so I, I think this is Grant's idea, and therefore, and like, so, as, so I was saying, how is this related to the kind of different assessment of modern science by Dewey and Grant? I mean, so far, we're just talking about like when it existed, when people had thought of it, you know, what they thought about it. Um, but I guess, like, um, in Dewey's view of science, even if there's something to mourn in the, in, like, Dewey definitely doesn't say this. Does he feel it a little bit? I don't know. <laughs> but even if there's something to mourn in the, the, the end of this static society that gives us the, the ability to believe in fixed ideals and whatever, um, there's no tragedy or faith to it, really. I mean, like this kind of necessity is not fate and is not tragedy, right? Like tragedy involves, um, you know, the tragic flaw, right? Like the, you know, um the the um the hero is noble but like commits hubris right like um um and and because of that like because of that is net led into this inevitable destruction it's not like it wouldn't be a tragedy I mean, of course, we use the word tragedy this way now, right? Like if, uh, you know, there was an earthquake and someone fell into a hole or something, we'd say, what a tragedy. But like that, you know, I mean, you were that you couldn't write a tragic play about that. <laughs> it's not a tragedy in that sense. And although it may involve something inevitable, it's not really fate in, in a strong sense of fate, right? Like it's not like, 
your lot, which is coming to you, no matter what you do. <laughs> um, it's just something that's just happened, right? So, I mean, so I think from Dewey's point of view, again, even if there were something to be sad about here, there would be no tragedy. There's just like, oh, well, you know, put up with it, <laughs> right? We find a new form of individualism, but like there's nothing else to do. Um, whereas, uh, um, from Grant's point of view, and again, like at least to some extent following Strauss on this, I think the moderns, right, and therefore from that point of view, the moderns start with Machiavelli. Um, on a certain reading of Machiavelli, and then like Hobbes, Descartes, Bacon, you know, like all these people have kind of like rushed headlong into the, um, into this progressive path because of their, because they thought that they could do what the ancients said you couldn't do. Um, but the ancients were right. <laughs> and now um, we're dealing with their fate, <laughs> with, right, with, with all, or our collective fate. Um, Okay, so that's the basic situation. And as I said, it's like, it's except for that perhaps important difference about the origin of the situation, he agrees with Dewey about what it is. It's this dynamic society. So um, now Grant's claim is that um, this new situation and here i'm not sure exactly which way to read it i think it's that this situation brings on liberalism as an ideology or is it liberalism is the ideology that made the moderns bring about the situation <laughs> that's that that's what i'm not sure i mean uh If you trace liberalism to Machiavelli and Hobbes and Locke, then it seems to be the latter, but most of the things that Grant says about it seem more like the former. So like, I'm not sure which is supposed to be cause and which is supposed to be effect, but in any case, this somehow goes with liberalism. Um, and liberalism is, you know, so liberalism is somehow about freedom. Uh, Liberalism is somehow about freedom. Um, I think um, I mean there's kind of three stages to it or three waves. Um, uh, Grant lists two waves and he, this is the place where he cites Strauss in the book it might be the only place it's it's common for Straussians to bury a single citation to Strauss in the middle of the book because this that's like a technique of um like only the very serious student will find that footnote and actually look up the source and they're the ones you want to direct, right? So you don't you don't say, you know, in the introduction, I want to acknowledge my dad to Strauss and blah, 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 blah. You just like, right. So anyway, um, this, but so there's there's two waves that he mentions, but there's kind of a third wave that he's not mentioning. And the, you know, the two waves that he mentions, like the first one is classical liberalism. Um, so, like, I mean, he describes this in, on the one hand, as, um, you know, the things we all associate with Lockean liberalism or with real liberalism, 
you know, the right to property, uh, political freedom, whatever, stuff like that. He also describes it in a less flattering light as the stage in which the only passion we want to emancipate is greed. <laughs> the other passions are not going to be emancipated yet. <laughs> right? um, so, so that's about freedom in some way. But then the second way, which he traces to Rousseau, and then somewhat oddly says, I don't remember, does Strauss say this too? He probably does, but it's still somewhat odd that it reached everyone else through Kant and Hegel. I mean, there's two odd things about that, at least. One odd thing is that as if Rousseau didn't have a huge direct influence, probably, no, it's depending on, on what. In some ways, more than Kant or Hegel. Right? But, uh, um, but also that this is, not really what I mean it is and it isn't. I don't know. Anyway, so so the second wave is supposed to be like man's essence is freedom. Anything that stands in the way of freedom is bad. Now, I mean, yeah, of course, Kant and Hegel do say that somehow, but it's not about doing what you want <laughs> or emancipation of the passions. Um, so, like, we have to be talking about, um, well, either we have to be talking about what they really mean, but they don't say it. That's of course, a particularly scandalous claim to make about Kant. I mean, to, to, that there's things that Kant thinks are true but doesn't tell you is one thing. That's perfectly consistent with his ethics. Um, I mean, uh, you know, not to mention things that he thinks are true and tells you, but just doesn't tell you very prominently or tells you with weird metaphors or whatever. But, um, but, but Kant said one thing and thought the opposite <laughs> is, right? Like that's a pretty strong claim about Kant given what we you know. I don't know why I should assume that everyone knows everything in this class, but right, just because everyone's nodding, but I don't know. <laughs> but you know, that like Kant is, uh, in in Kantian morality, uh, you're you're never allowed to lie, no matter what. But in any case, it's either that or it's kind of like what they meant in spite of themselves, I guess. But okay, so it's man's essence is freedom. Nothing is supposed to stand in the way of man's freedom. And then the third way would be Nietzsche. You know, so like. Okay, does Nietzsche think that man's essence is freedom? Well, no, I mean, not man, but over man. Hey, <laughs> Ubermensch. Um, and we're going to be free now by producing the Ubermensch in the future. Right, so like when when Grant says the, the you know the ultimate goal here is going to be to remake human nature, I was like he's thinking about Nietzsche. Um, I mean, not that Dewey doesn't say that too. <laughs> Again, Dewey says all these. Weird things that Nietzsche says, but when Nietzsche when Dewey says them, they, they don't sound so they don't like strike them so much. <laughs> but you know, Dewey also says we have to form a new individuality, we have to use technology to do it. Um the technique. Um Okay, so liberalism in eventually all of these senses is what, um, again, like 
is it what caused this in the first place, at least in its first stage? Or maybe Machiavelli foresaw the whole thing? Or is it Grant also sometimes says it's the idea uh, it's the ideology that goes great with corporate capitalism. So the like business interests are like, oh yeah, let's get some liberals in power. Um, right, and one one example of that is supposed to be how like so one example of that is supposed to be how the business establishment came out against Deaton Baker and supported Pearson. And another example is supposed to be how the business establishment came out against Barry Goldwater and supported Johnson. And you know, um, uh, Grant says, and you know, given how like what a huge defeat Goldwater suffered, we can see that this kind of conservatism had no future in the United States, right? So like, you know, fast forward to Reagan and you'll see that that wasn't exactly the best forecast, but so, um, um, uh, but so in any case, like whether it's cause or effect, this is this ideology that's supposed to go with the dynamic society of advancing capitalism and that entails um, two things. Um, one is that I've already mentioned a couple times. Uh, I can erase it for a One is Emancipation of the passions. Maybe I'm discussing it in the wrong order. I'm not sure. Even though this is the one that seems kind of less radical. Well, I'll say what both of them are, you know, you know, because the second one is like, um, the rejection of any standard of, of good, any fixed conception of the good light you know, the good human being, whatever. Um, um, so why am I saying, I mean, I guess how, it depends how you look at it. If you start from the end that liberalism is about freedom, then this is the one that, that follows most obviously, first of all, right? So it's about no one else telling you what to do. No one else telling you what to do means you do what you feel like. Now, I mean, again, that's not what it means to Kant, right? Like according to Kant, doing what you feel what you feel like is doing what someone else, so to speak, tells you to do. Because it's doing like because it, your passions are things that happen to you. That I guess is why they're called passions, <laughs> right? They're not things you do, so they're ways you're affected. They're like affects, right? And uh, so as long as you do what your passions tell you to do, you're you're like allowing you to be yourself to be pushed around by someone or something else. Um, but, um, um, on the other hand, if we go to Rousseau, well, what does Rousseau believe about this? Well, I don't know. Lord knows what Rousseau really thinks about anything. Um, but, uh, um, uh, he certainly seems to advocate emancipation of the passions in a lot of places. 
Although in other places it seems to be advocate going back to Sparta, <laughs> which is not exactly emancipation of the passions. But so in any case, I mean, you, you can definitely see why someone, so, sorry, why someone would say that this emancipation of the passions is what's required for freedom. Um, and um, as I said, the claim is that in the early phase, it's only the um, passion of greed that's emancipated. So like, this is a, a new and unflattering interpretation of the Protestant work ethic. Right, like before we were saying the Protestant work ethic is like, is like self-discipline. Um, and it's self-discipline aimed towards the acquiring of material possessions because that's good, what's good for society, or something like that. But um, even though, as, and as I said, I think I said Adam Smith says in the Wealth of Nations, but I'm not sure, it might be, Theory of moral principles. But Adam Smith says, in fact, getting rich is bad for you. It will make you unhappy. But uh, but lucky for society, a lot of people want to do it. <laughs> so, um, but you know, I mean, I guess Grant isn't necessarily disagreeing that it won't make you happy. Um, uh, but he is um, disagreeing that it's basically about self discipline it's basically about letting your greed go. And for that purpose, a certain amount of discipline of other passions is needed, right? This is what he says on page 58. Um, Early capitalism was full of moral restraints. The Protestant ethic inhibited any passion that did not encourage acquisition. The greed of each would lead to the greatest good for all. But in the age of high technology, the new capitalism can allow all passions to flourish along with greed. <laughs> right? So that's like the second stage um, where um, uh, emancipation of the passions is supposed to be general. Now, um, um, I don't know that any of the authors that we've read, except declare, um, I don't know. Perhaps it depends how you read Emerson and Thoreau. As far as I know, Grant never refers to Emerson or Thoreau anywhere. I mean, not in this book, I'm pretty sure, but I like to Google search and whatever. Um, so he's probably not thinking of them. He's probably not thinking of declare either. Um, 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 but I guess like he is thinking of the type of I mean, like you could see Declare as actually exemplifying this transition, uh, right? Like she's making fun of, or I mean, more than making fun of, but at least making fun of people who what they really want is hats, you know, right? Like that's this that's this type of liberalism. But she's saying, but but at the end she says like the true meaning of the deepest meaning of anarchism is that you dive into the volcanic self and you know like uh, uh, you know, see all those that seething contradictory bubbling whatever um i guess so it should be emancipated i mean she doesn't actually say so it should be emancipated hey um uh, i guess that's what she means Anyway, so like that's one thing. I guess Grant thinks this is bad. Um, I'm not sure exactly what. 
is bad about it, unless it's only as a symptom. I mean, this is this I think uh, is the one that really bothers him, and for obvious reasons, um, right? So uh, this is on page fifty-five. Um, it is the very signature of modern man to deny reality to any conception of good that imposes limits on human freedom. To modern political theory, man's essence is his freedom. Nothing must stand in the way of our absolute freedom to create the world as we want it. There must be no conceptions of good that put limitations on human action. So, um, I mean, again, if this is supposed to be the signature of modern man, it's not something that um, any of these people, including Rousseau, uh, advocate. <laughs> um, uh, At least explicitly. Um, Dewey sort of does, right? I mean, that is, if this is supposed to be a fixed standard of good, um, he, I mean, he doesn't object to it because it would interfere with human freedom. I don't think. Um, he objects to it because it would be useless in a dynamic society. But um, so, like, somehow this leads back to the problem I'm having about which comes first, liberalism or technology, right? Like, maybe. Um, Grant understands Dewey as being driven to this liberal conception, uh, this like, radically liberal conception that no standard of the good must be allowed to interfere with freedom um, because uh, um, because he recognizes the inevitability of technological advance and because he thinks what is inevitable must be good. Um, so, um, but of course, uh, like the easiest person to, to put in here again would be Nietzsche. Um, Grant certainly is thinking about Nietzsche. Um, Because, because it's a restraint on freedom now. I mean, I don't know how far to go into Nietzsche interpretation of this class, but uh, um, so, like, in some sense, Nietzsche is after autonomy. I, I probably said this before at some point in this class, I'm not sure, but you know, that, um, but like, the way he's into autonomy is that it appears the will, like for the will to be free, um, um, there's nothing outside. I think I talked about, we talked about Emerson, probably. You know, so for Nietzsche, there's, there's nothing outside the determinate series of nature without beginning and without end. Um, and so uh, it looks like the will can't be free. 
I mean, if you draw it the usual way, without beginning with and without end, um, this this is how Emerson and Coleridge before him both, well, and Kant basically describe what would happen if the will were part of nature. Nature is an endless series of necessary determinations, and so there could be no freedom of the will. And I think what I said before, what I think is right, or is at least one right thing about Nietzsche, is that Nietzsche says, well, a circle also has no beginning and no end. <laughs> um, so if you can accept the eternal recurrence, if you can will the eternal recurrence, then um, you do determine the So, okay, I mean, and yes, somehow, like part of getting to this is having the power of the say no to the dragon, thou shalt, or whatever, right? I mean, it's, uh, um, it is somehow related to, to, uh, to being, um, Beyond morality. In fact, in I, I just I'm reading Nietzsche with some grad students now. I just read in Genealogy of Morals, and Nietzsche says, like in parentheses, of course, autonomy and morality are like inconsistent with each other. <laughs> like, you know, and a direct dig against Kant, but I you know, but again, he's thinking just this that autonomy. We, although autonomy for Nietzsche means something weird, but that, but it, I mean, it's closer to what Kant means than than Royce. Is. <laughs> so that you know, autonomy requires rejection of any such standard. Um, so. Um, so again, like this is, these two things make up at least the end result of the liberalism as an ideology. And although you might think that they would lead to, um, I don't know, some kind of small community, anarchist, whatever, like Declare is talking about, um, Dewey, I mean, Grant is agreeing with Dewey that somehow these things fit perfectly with um corporate capitalism or well I mean the agreeing with Dewey Dewey said that we have to get beyond the money culture but I mean I think you can see that thing about getting beyond the money culture in Dewey and as as I was just suggesting in Declare you can see it as being like um you know the problem with classical liberalism is that it only emancipates greed or that it only allows a certain restricted kind of freedom. And therefore, it still has a fixed standard and it still has a, has a full emancipation of the passions. And so it's not consistent with, and like Dewey wouldn't call it capitalism anymore, but I think like uh, Grant would still see it as a form of capitalism. Um, um, the, because why would you see it still be as a form of capitalism? Um, I mean, because if you think of um, well, Oh, actually, no, I'm not getting this right now. So, like, um, com compare uh, Dewey's future society to um, Marxism. 
And again, this is why Grant, this is part of Grant's argument that Marxism is not as progressive, not as modern as what he's calling corporate capitalism or state capitalism. So um, on page 54 at the bottom, Marxism includes a doctrine of human good, call it, if you will, happiness, right? So in the paragraph above that, he argues that Marx has to believe in uh, the doctrine of the human good. Um, that's how Marx can distinguish between alienation and non-alienation. <laughs> Um, and um, uh, continue this quote, technological development is a means by which all men will realize this good, referring to Marx. But such a doctrine of good means that Marx is not purely a philosopher of the age of progress. He is rooted in the teleological philosophy that predates the age of progress. Right, so there's like an inherent human good and the purpose of history is to achieve it. Um, and the way we're going to achieve it is, among other things, by technological development, but that's just a means to that end. Um, um, and similarly, with respect to emancipation of the passions, Grant says, there's confusion in the minds of those who believe in socialism and the emancipation of the passions. This is on page 57. What is socialism if not the use of the government to restrain greed in the name of social good? Right, so I mean, that's like, that's what Grant is calling socialism. Right, so Grant, Grant's version of socialism is that we restrain the passions and in particular greed. Um, uh, so we don't just let people make what the market wants and buy whatever they want and whatever. We restrain all of that in the name of the public good. Um, and, there, and what Dewey calls socialism is not that. Right, so it is as Dewey himself said. It's about planning. It's but but planning, not evidently like long term plans that people are going to have to follow forever. Right, that would be back to this bad like fixed standard. Right, it's like planning in the moment, dealing with the current situation, with the problems that we have, and there is no goal. I mean, the goal is, if you like, the public good, but Dewey would say, don't talk about the public good. That's, you know, right? Like, just like you shouldn't talk about brotherhood and humanity and whatever, right? Like, that word is empty, except as applied. Um, so again, that's why I think, from Grant's point of view, Marxism is a form of social, and is therefore, in a certain way, conservative. But Dewey's socialism is not really social. It may be uh, tyranny, but it will be, according to Grant, but it's not socialist. <laughs> um, so, uh, oh boy. Um, They haven't even got to talking about Canada and the United States yet. Well, maybe I'll talk more about this next time because it's still getting me grants. So anyway, I'll just start talking about this. So, um, right, so like this seems to be leading towards a society of maximum individuality. Um, Right, once the passions are emancipated and there's no fixed standard of the good, everyone can do what they want. And like, so everyone's gonna do something different. Um, and Grant uh, attributes that conclusion to Dewey. This is one of the few places in the book where he mentions Dewey. <laughs> Maybe he's also hiding that, I don't know. 
In an earlier generation, liberals such as John Dewey claimed that this doctrine improved upon the past because it guaranteed a society in which all could do what they wanted, in which the standards of some would not be imposed on others. Tastes are different, and we should have a society that caters to the plurality of tastes. That's not exactly the Dewey that we read. Um, it might be something Dewey says somewhere else. Um, but in any case, um, Grant, in response to that idea, and, and Dewey admits this up to a point, says that in fact, the effect of this unrestrained individualism is going to be the opposite. As far as things that people actually care about, it's going to be the effect is going to be to homogenize, to standardize in Dewey's terminology. So this is continuing on the same page. This quote, this is the quote I mentioned before. Um, but this is not what is happening in our state capitalism. In the private sphere, as all kinds of tastes are allowed. Nobody minds very much if we prefer women or dogs or boys, as long as we cause no public inconvenience. But in the public sphere, such pluralism of taste is not permitted. The conquest of human and non-human nature becomes the only public value. The vaunted freedom of the individual to choose becomes either the necessity of finding one's role in the public engineering or the necessity of retreating into the privacy of pleasure. Right, so in the public sphere, in the in, in the actions that really matter, and like I think Dewey agrees, that's where the actions really matter, right? In the public sphere, uh, Grant is saying that um, um, these things actually don't lead to everyone being able to have their own taste and doing whatever they feel like, um, because these things are connected to, and again, now the question is, which is supposed to be cause and which is supposed to be effect? But somehow these things are connected to the constant progress of technology and the conquest of nature. Um, and so um, that's what everyone has to do. You're not allowed to say, hey, can we, can we slow this down here? <laughs> can we not conquer this part of nature? Yeah, we say that true individualism be able to choose whether or not one to reject the standard good or is that something that is that makes it easy well i don't so i mean i don't think first of all i don't think grant is committed to saying that any kind of individualism is good right like he's not you know so um, um yeah i mean i think he's he's both He's both agreeing with Dewey that in some sense the result of this is radical individualism, but he's saying radical individualism doesn't mean uh, um, originality and uniqueness. The radical individuals are all going to do the same thing. <laughs> I mean, that is in private, the, you know, they'll all they'll do different things, right? But that's precisely because. It's private and has no effect outside your privacy. Right. So it is really just like, you know, some people like green grapes, some people like purple grapes, whatever, right? Um, so uh, but in public, there's only one thing you can do. Now, I mean, only one thing you can do. So like I think do we see the originality and uniqueness in the different ways that people contribute? To this common project, right? Like there again, his example is is the way modern science is supposed to work, and the different scientists contribute to the common project, but they do it using their own originality and initiative and whatever. But I think Grant, first of all, may share a more pessimistic, like more Korean view of what modern how modern science works. Um, but beyond that, I think he would say, step back and you'll see that, that these people don't really disagree about anything important, right? So that their individuality and uniqueness is just kind of pointless, right? I mean, it's 
Yeah, I prefer to conquer nature by doing this piece. Do you prefer to conquer nature by doing that piece? Because we're both contributing to the same project. And that's why we conform to each other and we all move forward. We're all really doing the same thing. Um, okay, I think I'm out of time, but um, um, but I guess, you know, what I'm gonna have to talk about next time is number one, how is this related to the issues about universal, universality and individuality that we've been talking about since the beginning of the course? And number two, how is this related to Grant's analysis of the relationship between the United States and Canada? We'll talk to you about it on Thursday. And once again, Thursday's class is going to be via Zoom, but at the regular time. All right, see you then. Bye.